Testing, one, two, three. It's coming in. Good All right. to be on Inspired Insider. All right, that's right. So, Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have a legend of business, Tom Kalinske. Uh, he was CEO of Mattel for 15 years. He's had the opportunity to help build some of the best known brands for kids, including, you've heard of all these, Hot Wheels, Masters of the Universe, Matchbox, Sega Genesis, Sonic the Hedgehog, and many more. He was CEO of Sega, CEO of Leapfrog, which is the largest educational toy company in the world. The list goes on and on. And he's currently executive chairman of Global Education Learning. He was featured in the book Console Wars, which we will get into. Tom, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Glad to be here. I'm excited to hear some of your big lessons, some of the mistakes learned in your journey of success, what worked, what didn't work. And one thing, I read a description of console wars, and I thought I wanted to break this down. So console, one of the descriptions I read was console wars is a story of a humble family man with an extraordinary imagination, a gift for turning problems into competitive advantages, inspired a team of underdogs to slay a giant as a result gave birth to a 60 billion dollar industry now i want to talk about the first one which is the humble family man um you're married with six kids how do you manage six kids with all this ceo position and business you know the 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 business that you had to do well that that has really been a big challenge for me because uh, first of all, I had a, I had a son by a, a prior marriage, and then Karen and I had five children together, hmm. one after another. You know, we had five of they two years apart for wow. many years, and uh, uh, I always try to spend enough time with my family. And hmm. and Karen and I, I mean, we've had weekends where we've had three girls playing in soccer games right. around the Bay Area or even in, up as far as Sacramento. And we would go to three games on Saturday and three games on Sunday, and sometimes it became impossible if the distance was too far. So I'd it have is to impossible. Take, uh, the, yeah, I'd take one of the trips and she'd take the other, and we divided and conquered. But we we tried to always stay very close to our our children, and uh, you know I, I I don't know if I did it well enough, very frankly. I mean I think that's one of the things if I look back on my life and say, gee, you know maybe I worked too hard, maybe I should have spent more time with with my kids. But on the other hand. I think I have a very good relationship with uh, all of them. How did you manage it with you know, probably all the business meetings and responsibilities you had? Because I'm thinking out of all the things that are the most impressive out of your resume, the six kids is definitely up there. I don't even know how you did that. Yeah. And, well, it is, it is the most important thing, obviously, yeah. that I've done in my life. And uh, I think it also, because I was so involved in their uh, educational upbringing and in their schools, I served on... On, uh, we sent our children to a, a, a school called Keys here in Palo Alto, California, and I served on that school board for something like 13 years. Wow. I was the longest serving board member that they've ever had. And, you know, that kept me in, close to them because I was so involved in their school life and involved in their uh, soccer lives and their sports lives, whether it was soccer, tennis or, or other things. Uh, but it's, it was difficult. When you travel a lot, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. And how did the did your kids influence any of these brands or games in any way when you bring it home? Tell, tell me about that. Oh, sure. You know, when I was at Mattel, and well, I'm sure we'll get into that story a little bit yeah. later. But one of I was working on the Barbie brand, and here I have three girls. So uh, I used to use them as my test market. Of course, you're not supposed to do that. You know, we all know we're not supposed to rely on our wives or children as a test market, but it's hard to resist. For sure. And so what they liked often became uh, a product. I actually did, uh, uh, my daughter's names are Ashley, Nicole, and Kelly. I did all three of them as dolls. The only one that was successful was the last one, <laughs> Kelly, <laughs> Barbie's cousin. But anyway... Uh, uh, our, anyway, it uh, it did influence my life, and then with the boys, the same thing. You know, try out uh, Masters of the Universe on my eldest son, mm -hmm. but then at Sega, of course, try out uh, video games on my on my boys. Yeah, and 
in Tom with, and part of that description in Console Wars, it talks about turning problems into competitive advantages. What were, what were some of the problems that were turned into competitive advantages? Oh, my goodness. Well, you have to think back. I know this is hard to imagine, but when I got to Sega, when I accepted the position as CEO of Sega of America, Nintendo had a 98% share of market, wow. the video game market. <laughs> you know, Atari had gone away, and Nintendo had emerged as the video game company, and they basically were a monopolist. And the, the way they controlled the market today would be it would be considered illegal i'm sure but what they did was uh they controlled the number of cartridges you as a third-party manufacturer could receive so if you argued with them over price or you argued with them over policy you might not receive Mm -hmm. the number of cartridges you thought you could sell and obviously that was very tight control also if you were a third-party publisher like an Activision or a, or, a, or a Ubisoft or a Tengen or an EA, if you decided to publish your game on some other system, Nintendo would cut you off completely. Wow. The same Pretty thing cutthroat. Was true, yeah, we're very cutthroat. The same thing was true at retail. So if you were a retailer and you displeased Nintendo, you wouldn't get the shipments of, of uh, game machines and cartridges that you wanted. Even companies as large as Walmart were affected by by Nintendo's policies. Hmm. And so it was a very difficult situation to break into. I hmm. had to obviously convince both third-party publishers and retailers to carry Sega Genesis. Uh, and eventually we, we, we won the, all of those uh, battles and, uh, and prevailed. But there's a lot of stories involved in it. So what was one that you remember? Because that almost seems insurmountable. They not only had the market share, but they had this controlling effect on yeah. the distribution. How did you, when you be, you know came on for Sega, what did you do first? Well, uh, first of all, I hired, I, I, I put together a very good team of mm-hmm. very creative people. And I've always believed in that. I've, and I've always tried very hard to get the right team together. And I, and I think I, I managed it uh, quite well at, at Sega. They were, you know, I think the book, calls them outcasts or something they weren't outcasts they were just unusual <laughs> you know they were they were very smart people also I, i'm one thing i'm kind of proud of is yeah. three of my key executives were female now think back to 1990 there were no female executives in the video game business this was a male dominated business but i needed smart people and and uh, three of the people happened to be female and they were very very good but anyway back to the walmart story i'll tell you the story of walmart yeah. how we got in there it's my i think one of the more interesting stories of this dominance that nintendo had so i i had you know i came out of mattel for goodness sakes we had great relationships with with walmart i knew sam walton i used to fly around with him in a plane doing store checks so i knew every executive at walmart that you can imagine and i go there as, after i'm at sega and they won't buy sega genesis or our products wow. our car, our games and i was just floored by this and so what we did was uh, you've probably never been to Bentonville to no, I have it. To, I have it. to Walmart headquarters but it's a you know it's a small town off of a main road well right off of the after you turn off the main road there was a small strip mall uh, shopping center and there was a vacant store so I rented that store put a huge Sega sign up and a sign that said come play Sega Genesis games for free and I put in like 25 big TVs, the biggest you could get in those days, and 25 game machines. And I literally, and then I started, I bought every billboard in town and with Sega advertising, with radio advertising, TV advertising. I bought the seat cushions at the University of Arkansas football game that said Sega on one side. So when they held up the seat cushions to, you know, different color seat cushions to make different uh, signs, everybody in the when they turned them around, would see this huge mass of Segas across the stadium. Anyway, there was a line of teenage boys outside of this store, and I'm bombarding the market with advertising with the famous Sega Scream. And uh, finally, the phone rings, and it was a senior VP from Walmart, and, they, and a guy I knew very well. And he just said, <laughs> Tom, just stop it. We give up. We'll buy the damn product. And that was how we got into, into Walmart. I love that story. It's a great story. Um, I want to go back because I want to hear some of the Mattel days, some of the Sega days. But what I want to hear what was the inspiration for you growing up? 
great question. I, I was very fortunate. My, my father was, was a uh, professor of engineering, also a Wisconsin graduate, by the oh, way, undergrad. Oh, nice. And so was my mom, and my mom was an art major. And so I have strong Wisconsin roots. My uncle, John Weber, was uh, head of the electrical engineering department at wow. Wisconsin uh, uh, while I was there in the, in the 60s. And so strong Wisconsin roots, but my family ended up moving to Arizona, to Tucson, Arizona, because ah. my dad was a, became, he went, in, he went from, being, from teaching, he went into being a, a VP of R&D designing water treatment plants and water treatment equipment for a company called Infilco. And they needed a lot of land to lay these plants out before they'd move them to wherever they were putting them, yeah. whether it was in a city or across the country or across the world. They did plants all the way into Egypt. And, and so I grew up in Tucson. And one of the big inspirational characters of my life was a guy named Eduardo Caso, who ran the Tucson Boys Chorus. And so my mother dragged me down there. I didn't want to do this. But she thought I could sing, and so I did. I sang in the Tucson and Arizona Boys Chorus for six years. I traveled the United States. I didn't go to regular school most of the time. Really? I was on the Ed Sullivan Show twice, the George Goebel Show, uh, sang for different presidents in the White House. Uh, and, and it was quite an experience. And this guy really had a big impact on my life, uh, showing me the United States. Obviously, we're traveling by our own Greyhound bus. But also... Um, he was just a, a really good guy, you know. He he really taught us ethics and right from wrong, and was a constant presence in our in our lives. And uh, uh, one of the other, I mean, I'll just mention this because you might find it interesting. Yeah. One of the other guys in our group was a guy named John uh, Duschendorf, who changed his name later to John Denver, and another guy named Pete Ronstadt, whose sister was a pretty good sister named Linda. So, uh, you know, our group was actually very good. We wow. rivaled the Vienna Boys Chorus, and that was my childhood. I mean, my childhood was not normal. I, I traveled from when I was 10 years old to when I was 16 years old, uh, touring and, mm -hmm. and singing in concerts across the world. How did your mom know you had this knack for singing? I guess I sang in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds like she dragged you there. and She you were, did. Yeah. It's yeah. just random. Wow. Um, and so from that, and that's what I was wondering actually about the background, because I saw that you went to University of Wisconsin and then Arizona for grad school. And I was wondering, that seems strange. You know, why would someone go to Arizona from Wisconsin? So, yeah, well, it was a little strange. I mean, first of all, the first winter I spent in Wisconsin, I, I for, <clears throat> boy, was that an experience, you know, when the wind is howling and all I had was a, I had a sweater and a windbreaker my first freshman year. <laughs> they I discovered you need you. a little bit warmer coat than that. But sure. uh, w w I went back to Arizona because uh, during, in 66, when I graduated, I started grad school at Wisconsin. <clears throat> I actually did my first 12 units of business school at Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, in those days, you, that was common. You did go straight from undergrad into graduate school. Today, that's not so common. And, and uh, you know, the Vietnam War was raging and the draft was going on. And, and um, I had a choice to where I wanted to go spend my military service. And so I chose a armor unit that was located in Tucson, Arizona, because I was familiar with it. So I, mm -hmm. I went into the Army down there. And that's why I finished my master's at uh, University of Arizona. Mm -hmm. So, Tom, what did the early days of your career look like? Obviously, you don't start off at the top. No, it was pretty unusual, too. <laughs> I had this, uh, I credit a guy named Professor Call at actually University of Arizona, who was a marketing professor, who recommended me for a series of jobs when I graduated. And one of them was, uh, I, he recommended me for Procter & Gamble and for, for J. Walter Thompson in New York City. Well, I had actually spent a summer doing a little bit of work for Procter & Gamble, so I'd already had a little bit of that experience. I thought I'd try something different. I went to work for J. Walter Thompson in New York City, and in those days, they, the advertising business was quite different than it is today. They had a group that was dedicated to coming up with designing new products for existing clients. And so I went into that group, hmm. and I worked on things like Chungking frozen egg rolls, where we created frozen egg rolls for Chungking. And I, the, one of our other clients was Miles Laboratories, the one-a-day vitamins, and in those days, Chalks Vitamins. And they one day, uh, uh, Bristol Myers came out with a, another vitamin called PALS. There were animal shapes and brightly colored and chewable vitamins, and it just destroyed the chalks chewable vitamin business. 
Uh, you've never seen a decline as rapid as that one. And so Miles was panicked, and they said, hey, you got to come up with a brand for, uh, for us to do for, for, for children's chewable vitamins. And we did all this research, tons of market research. Long story short, we came up with Flintstones, and we sold them the idea of doing Flintstones vitamins. Uh, initially, they didn't want to do it, but they eventually chose to. And so, you know, we had a big hand in making Flintstones vitamins uh, successful, and it became the number one children's vitamin in the world in six months. And it still is today, as far as I know. So it was quite a a successful story. And that's what, by the way, introduced me to Mattel, because I had to appear before a Senate subcommittee on children's advertising. I think I might have been 26 or 7 years old. And only a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, I'm appearing in a Senate subcommittee on children's advertising. And basically, the Senate uh, subcommittee was criticizing all the sugared cereal advertising, candy advertising, toy advertising. And we got thrown in there, children's vitamin advertising. Because we used to do commercials that showed children rotoscoped with animated characters doing things like climbing a mountain. So it would be yabba dabba doo, yabba dabba doo. Flintstone's vitamins are good to chew. They and we'd have. show Fred Flintstone climbing a mountain with this young boy or something. Right. And so I, here I am. I'm in the Senate chamber, uh, subcommittee room. And I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but the senators sit way up high. And they have my mahogany desks, and you're way down low. And you've got a Formica table and a folding chair and your lawyer sitting next to you. And Senator Margaret Chase Smith points from Maine, points at me and says, so, Mr. Kalinske, you think selling drugs to children is a good idea? And I said, well, Senator, I'm, I'm sure you're aware that uh, Flintstones vitamins aren't a drug. They're a nutritional supplement. And you, I know you know that 45% of America's children aren't getting proper nutrition in their meals. And this is a way moms can be assured that if they take a, a chewable vitamin, Flintstones vitamin, their children will get the right vitamins and mineral in their children's diet. And by the way, I've got letters from mom. So let me read you one of them. And I pulled out this letter from a mom thanking me because it was the only way she felt comfortable that her child was getting the proper nutrition. And then I grabbed a bag, a mailbag, huge mailbag. And I said, I have 5,000 more letters here from moms. Would you like me to read some of those to you as well? And Senator Smith said, well, no, thank you, Mr. Klinsky, and immediately went and attacked the uh, sugared uh, cereal guys. So the guys from Mattel were sitting behind me, and they just thought this was funny. And they started laughing and said, who the hell are you? <laughs> and, and that was how I met Mattel. And they, lay, they recruited me because of that experience to Mattel. So I ended up as a product manager at Mattel because of that experience. So what did you do then when you went to Mattel as a product manager? Well, my first job was uh, preschool toys, and so I worked on uh, the CNCs, the Jack in the Boxes, uh, developed a brand called Tough Stuff, which were unbreakable toys. That was a little bit unusual. We guaranteed them for five years. They wouldn't break. Developed wood toys called Putt Putts, Putt Putt Railroad, Putt Putt Cars, Wood Cars. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, I was very happy doing that. And, and one day, the founder of, of Mattel, Ruth Handler, came into my cubicle, which was right outside the men's room, so I had lots of visitors, and 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 she said, Tom, Barbie had its first decline in sales last year, and the retail buyers say it's over for Barbie, and my sales force says, forget Barbie, let's go on to something else, and all the Wall Street analysts are criticizing us because they think it's over for Barbie and we should do other things. What do you think about that? And I said, Ruth, that's the dumbest thing I have ever heard. Barbie will be around long after you and I are gone. And she said, that's what I wanted to hear. You're now the marketing director on Barbie. <laughs> and so <laughs> I end up going from preschool toys to Barbie, which, uh, and now this really will seem unbelievable to you. Barbie was had declined to $42 million in worldwide revenue. Think about that. Today, it's over $2 billion. Wow. Well, anyway, so I built it, or I and my team built it from $42 million to $550 million by segmenting the market many, many different ways, doing Barbies for young girls, doing Barbies for old collect- collectors who wanted uh, to see a Barbie in a De Laurentiis outfit. Uh, we did career Barbies. We did the first President Barbie was done while I was the you know by then marketing director on it. Uh, we did career Barbies, Doctor Barbie, Astronaut Barbie, all these different things that we did segmenting the market built the the Barbie business too. 
I thought it was a pretty good deal. We built it to five hundred fifty million, and I turned it over to a gal named Jill Barad, and she built it to about two billion. But I always tell her that the the percent increase from forty two million to five hundred fifty million is a lot more <laughs> than the percent increase from five hundred fifty to two billion. Or you laid the groundwork. Yeah. Why do you think Ruth approached you with that question? Well, that's a good question. You know, I had a I had a good relationship with her. I was one of the Ruth Handler was. Um, a very unusual woman. We learned a lot from her. And you think about those days, too, 1972, 3, 4. She was CEO of a very large company and was one of the only female CEOs in the world. Mm. And she had a lot of pressure on her. And uh, I was one of the people that she would call in her office and talk to. Sometimes she would beat me up, very frankly. She was she was very uh, open in her criticism. Yeah. And you learn from that criticism. Right. She would she would criticize you, and you had to kind of take it. Yeah. Uh, she invented things that for, for us management people to track uh, in terms of our sales and inventory, tools that we use, because we didn't have very good computers in those days. Right. And uh, so she was really inspirational to me. She taught me a lot about business in general, but she also talk, taught me that you had to uh, really do a good job if you expected to get ahead and get praised. So... Uh, I was fortunate to have her as a mentor, and I had another guy there named Ray Wagner, who was the CEO of the company, or, she, or president of the company, rather. She was CEO. He was president. And he actually stayed for many, many years, and Ruth uh, had, to re had to leave the company because of SEC issues during a time when she was fighting about with uh, breast cancer. Wow. And uh, so, Ru uh, so Ray became my mentor, and he was also just terrific at uh, at challenging me and making me do things over and over, and and uh, getting plans more refined and uh, being more complete and analysis and what have you. So I learned a lot while I was at Mattel. So Tom, what did Ruth beat you up about? What was some of her criticism <laughs> when you behind uh, behind the doors? <laughs> Gosh, she once she once beat me up over a package design that she didn't think showed a product off well enough and basically I was called in her office and it was one of these things how after all these years how could you be so stupid <laughs> allow this package to get out on the shelf and she's like pointing at me and tapping me on the shoulder and how did you do this this is wrong and finally her husband who was the other founder of Mattel Elliot who was the great toy inventor just a wonderful warm man they had adjoining offices and there was an open space where he could hear what was going on in her office. He came in and he, and he said to her, that's enough, Ruth. <laughs> that, was, that was the end of her beating me up over a poor package design. <laughs> that's good. So Tom, how, tell me about how did you then, because obviously there are many people who worked for Mattel and you know, not many obviously became CEO. What, how did you rise to CEO then? Well, I, you know, I, I did a lot of different things. Obviously, reviving the Barbie business and rebuilding it was uh, quite a coup, frankly. Same thing was true with Hot Wheels. Hot Wheels had declined, and, and under my regime, we managed to build it back to a $100 million business. And then we were challenged. We didn't have a, a male action figure line. You know, Hasbro had G.I. Joe and, and then Star Wars, and we didn't have anything. And so I was challenged by the board, you got to come up with a, a male action line. And so we did, again, all this research with boys. Yeah. And, and we came up with uh, this heroic figure that we ended up naming He-Man yeah. and Masters of the Universe. And he had a, an adversary named Skeletor, and they fought over Castle Grayskull. For sure. And, and it became quite a successful toy line. And then one day, the chairman of the board said to me, well, yeah, it's a $75 million brand now, but it'll never be as important as a Star Wars because you don't have a movie or a TV show and you can't get one. And I said, you want to bet? And so I went out and worked with a guy named Lou Scheimer at Filmation Studios. And Group W owned a lot of television stations back in those days and, and, and syndicated a lot of their own shows across the United States. And so I came back with a plan, figured out that it would cost us seven, I still remember this very well, uh, it would cost us about $7 million in those days to do 65 one-half-hour episodes of a He-Man Masters of the Universe television show. And Group W would put up half of that amount, and Mattel would put up half of that amount. I convinced the board to put up $3.5 million. And uh, 
And we developed this television show, and we went out, and, and we didn't expect to make money off of it, frankly, but we thought it would certainly help build the brand. Right. Well, it ended up being a very highly rated television show. Uh, when you do a syndication deal, you in return, you give the show to the stations in return for advertising time. So we got, I, don't, I think it was six minutes in total, so Group W sold three, we got three to use ourselves. Yeah. And we would use the three minutes of advertising time for other products, Hot Wheels, Barbie even, other products. Right. But we also sold time to McDonald's and to other yeah. uh, toy companies and, and clothing companies for kids. And we ended up making a huge profit off of the television show. So anyway, there was another example. And we built a $750 million brand, by the way. Wow. Um, Mr. became a $750 million business, which in those days was was. Quite in these days is pretty significant too. Still significant. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you... and then after that we did a bunch of other television shows. So we ended up doing television shows for Princess of pa Princess Power, Princess of Power, and for for Rainbow Bright, Popples, sure. a lot of other uh, characters that we developed. And I think all of that cumulative experience. I think I was fortunate because I had worked on basically every part of the toy industry, and then had, had this television experience where. That was why I was selected over other very capable executives to end up being president of the company and eventually CEO. Yeah. Tom, how do you, in the original research with He-Man, how did you, what showed that, okay, we need to create a He-Man-like figure? What were you seeing in the research? Because, I mean, you could have created anything, right? I mean, yeah. this is... Yeah, yeah. And, and we did, by the way. Hmm. So what we start, we, gosh, you're bringing back memories. We started with what we call B-sheets, which were really related to the size of a poster that we made. And we did a drawing, it was probably about uh, 20 by 30 drawings of different characters. So we had police characters, space uh -huh. characters, uh, famous detectives, famous people like Batman and Superman and who have you. And we, and we had this very heroic, muscular, blonde guy. And we just showed these images to boys and asked them which ones they were most interested in. Hmm. And then we showed hundreds. And we'd get that down to, as you would imagine, Star Wars would always be in there because it was a very, very strong brand in those days. And next to Star Wars, it turned out that this heroic character, hmm. boys liked the idea of a strong, muscular, heroic character who always did the right thing. And it won in the research. And, and after the B-shirt research, by the way, we went to physical models. So we had sculpted models of what these characters would look like in toy form, in male action yeah. figure form, and then researched those. And again, out of those, He-Man and Skeletor won. And so we ended up uh, turning it into toy products. So was, did anything about that surprise you? Like when you were seeing people choosing things? Did you? I mean, obviously, you probably had a prediction like, oh, this one's definitely going to win or something like that. What surprised you about the process? Well, what surprised me was, I, and I think if you had done it today, it would have ended up differently, but I was surprised that the, uh, the uh, Batman and Spider-Man and Superman weren't more popular. But in those days, for whatever reason, they weren't. Today, I think it would be quite different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So tell me, what was a day in the life like as CEO of Mattel? Well, I mean, it, it, a lot of it is spent in meetings, obviously. I mean, it's a, it's a grueling meeting. You, you have to understand the toy business is uh, what I would call a fashion business. You have to create a new line every year. Yeah, that's tough. It's, it's tough. So every day you're in product meetings designing the products for the next year's line or, the, or even the year after that's line. And so you're in constant product meetings interrupted by retailers who you know want to know where their shipment of Barbie dolls is or why they didn't get it right. enough or what happened and uh, or they have too much inventory and they want you to take some back so lots of issues and problems like that where senior management of all the different retail firms would be talking to you as well as as of course all the internal meetings that you have and then occasionally meeting with outside inventors as, as well so you were always extremely busy, and it, it was a, uh, you know, it was not an eight-hour job, a day job. It was a right. seven in the morning to seven at night kind of job. Mm -hmm. So what was, what's the toughest part about the toy industry? The fact you have to have recreate a hit every year, you know, and and people say, well, gee, it must be easy to do a business like Barbie. Not really, because 
Even the Barbie brand, over 50% of the sales that occur in any given year are from products that didn't exist the year before. Wow. So you think about that when you got a $2 billion business today, $1 billion of that has to be recreated every year. That's... And the same thing is, was true of all the other lines that, I, that we had in our portfolio. You know, you have to have new new product every every year for uh, to satisfy uh, you know kids' play desires. How many do you have to create to have a success? Like each year, do you have to for every three you come out with, there's one success, or is there some kind of ratio that that works? Well, you you hope for you hope they're all successful, and obviously they're not going to be. So in the in the case of Barbie, you know, we would as I mentioned, we segmented the line, and so we would have. A specific new doll for young girls that was easy to dress or under. So we'd have a specific new career or two, a doctor Barbie or a veterinarian Barbie. Uh, we'd have a specific new high-priced accessory, and usually that was a, a house or a condominium or something like that. And then a mid-price one would be some kind of a car or a boat. And the low-price ones would be bicycles and gym equipment or something like that. Yeah. And you hope they're all successful, but obviously out of the mix, something's going to be more successful than the other. And, right. you, and you then would ride that successful product and just remember you're producing across the ocean now because we weren't producing much in in the US anymore and today they're doing nothing in the US now. So it's all in China and you got a long boat trip here so you've got to you've got to get it all here in time for Christmas and if all of a sudden it doesn't sell until Thanksgiving, well it's too late to to get any more into the country to sell yeah. in time for Christmas. So that makes the that makes the business difficult as as well. Yeah, I mean there's a lot of moving parts. What's yes, what's been a tough a really tough decision you had to make as CEO? Well, I think for me the toughest decision, and many, and I've had to do it several times. Whether when, when, when I was at Sega and when I was at uh, Mattel and even at Leapfrog, is the firing of good friends. You know, when you've got it, when somebody's really a good personal friend, yeah. and uh, and you have to let them go, that is really hard to do. And then to, you know, sometimes I've managed to maintain a relationship with them on a personal level, even though they're no longer with the with yeah. the company. That's also hard to do. Yeah. Very difficult. I'm sure there's a lot of people, you know, who are listening to this who will have to do that or have done it. Is there a certain approach that you take to I mean, there's no easy way to do it, but there's no easy way to do it. I mean, and you, you have to make it non personal. It's gotta be the performance on the job and the business unit and if that particular brand or business unit is suffering and and it's time to make a change in the leadership of it. Uh, that's just, you have to explain it in those, those terms. There yeah. is no, uh, animosity. The, the guy probably, or gal probably had success in their career. They wouldn't be in these higher level, uh, executive roles. Right. And you just have to explain it's better for the company that they move, that they move on and it'll end up being better for them, uh, in the long run because they'll end up being successful in some other business. Yeah. So what then brought you to Sega? So, uh, between Mattel and Sega, I had uh, helped uh, buy Matchbox Toys out of bankruptcy in the UK with a friend of mine from China who actually we used bank money. We didn't use any of our own money. And we companies are in receivership for a reason, uh, and uh, we had to fix all those problems, and we did. It took three years, and I would say that three-year period is probably the toughest period of my life because I was traveling almost 200 and some days. Whoa, a week. really? Yeah, and that, that was the time when I wasn't seeing my children regularly, and that was very difficult. I mean, I tried, but it's hard because the main business was in UK and Europe, and the manufacturing, we had to move from the UK. The reason they were losing money, they were still making die-cast cars in the UK, which is not cost-efficient, and we ended up moving it to uh, China and Macau, and then it was cost-efficient, and that, that helped a lot. But we also had to uh, reorganize the business in, in the UK, uh, and in Germany and France and Italy and then in, eventually in the United States. Um, and uh, in, anyway, I did all that and then we ended up selling the company to Tyco, which ended up being bought by Mattel. So the whole thing went round a uh, big circle. But uh, I was, so I was on vacation with my wife and then my daughters in Hawaii. And I was literally lying on a beach in Maui. Sounds good. And this guy shows up who I knew from 
years past from Sega. Sega had been owned by Paramount Pictures. It used to report to famous guys like Mike Eisner and Barry Diller at Paramount. Yeah. And I knew this fellow. He was head of marketing for Sega back then. And he's, he's now CEO of, of and chairman of Sega. And he says, uh, you've got to come to Japan with me. I want you to run Sega of America as CEO. And I said, well, my God, why would I want to do that? I'm on vacation. And he said, no, 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 no. It'll only take a, a brief interruption of your vacation. Come with me. I want to show you 16-bit technology. And basically, I said, go away and leave me alone. And did he finally, wait, does he, he was randomly there? It, no, he tracked me down. My secretary really? knew where I was, and he tracked me down. Oh he God. had been calling me, and I hadn't been responding because yeah, I was on vacation. And he tracked me down and literally uh, found me on this beach in Hawaii. Oh, my God. He knew the hotel. He really I wanted you. Yeah, he really wanted wow. me. Finally, so I eventually, and because of that largely, I did go. I interrupted my vacation, left the family there, flew to Japan, took a look at 16-bit technology, and he was right. I thought it was really, really impressively different than 8-bit technology. And at the same time, he showed me a color handheld uh, game unit. We ended up calling it Game Gear to compete with Game Boy, which yeah, was yeah. black and white. So this was the first time I'd seen a color LCD screen playing video games. And that really knocked me out. I thought that was just terrific. So I ended up going back to my vacation for a few more days, and then I negotiated a deal with this guy, and I ended up uh, becoming CEO of, of Sega of America and uh, moved the family up to Northern California, basically where we still are today, and went to work for uh, Sega. So then, then obviously, you know, when you were at Mattel, you said, um, you know, the team is very important always. So what do you do when you come on at Sega? Well, that was, I, I was fortunate. There were two guys already there, or actually three guys who were already there who were really great. They turned out to be really great executives. Um, and it was kind of funny. One of them was Al Nielsen. And Al had actually been at Mattel in his earlier life. Another one was Paul Rio. Paul Rio had been in finance at Mattel. And Paul and I used to play tennis against each other and, and knew each other very, very well. He, he had worked on, in different areas of Mattel, but uh, eventually ended up reporting up to me. And so I knew him well. And Al Nielsen uh, had been a buyer at Pennies before he joined Mattel. So I knew him from his buying experience. Oh, wow. And these two guys were really, really terrific. Al was a marketing guy. Paul was an operations and finance guy. And so that was a good start. And, uh, and then uh, the surprising thing was the fellow from Japan who was basically sent to report everything back to headquarters, a fellow named Shinobu Toyota, became my left arm and, uh, and ended up becoming uh, more Americanized than, uh, than Japanese, I would say. And, uh, you know, he really supported us and he... Uh, he had a way of communicating the good news uh, to Japan or the bad news to Japan in a way where it was more acceptable. Uh, and sometimes he didn't tell them the stuff we were doing because he knew they wouldn't agree with it. And I, I didn't learn that till later. But anyway, so I had a, I had the three guys as a start of a team, and then we hired. And we hired a gal named uh, 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 Diana Fornassier, who became our, co our other head of marketing on the other part of the business. And we hired a gal... Uh, named uh, Ellen Beth Van Buskirk, who became our head of communications and advertising and PR, who was just terrific. And uh, I can, and then a gal uh, named Madeline Canapa Schroeder, who became our, our uh, head of uh, R&D. So, so, so one of our heads of R&D. We had another one named Joe Miller that we brought in. And so we formed a team around this core nucleus and uh, very, very, I always hired based on not necessarily the, the experience you'd had, but how smart you were. And these were really smart people. And um, this team and others that I, I'm not going to name everybody, uh, we took on Nintendo and ended up uh, going from a 2% share of market to at one point over 60% share of market and passed Nintendo and share of market in, in three short years. So what's your personal favorite Sega game? Sonic 2. Sonic 2? Yes. <laughs> I think it was the best Sonic game we did or ever was done. And, uh, you know, we we sold, I think that was, for a long time, it was the largest selling game in the history of video games. 
we sold like four hundred million dollars worth of one product, so it was pretty su substantial. Yeah, I remember getting my first Sega and playing Sonic the Hedgehog and thinking, "This is unbelievable!" So yeah, how fast? It moved, yeah, yeah, how fast the graphics? It was it was just much different from the Nintendo you know graphics at that time for sure. Right, right. So then when so you know when did console wars come? When when someone approached you. Blake, did Blake approach you for this book, or how did that work? Yes, he did. Uh, uh, two years ago, he uh, got hold of me, I, I think uh, initially by phone, and he said, you know, I've been looking for the history of, of video games and the, specifically the battle between Sega and Nintendo, and I can't find anything on it other than a few magazine articles, and uh, I want to do a book about that period of time. And my response was, Blake, that's really nice. I think there's probably 20 people in the world who care. Uh, so probably not a great idea. And he said, no, 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 you're wrong. There's a whole generation that grew up with Nintendo and Sega, and they would be very interested in this story. And I've heard bits and pieces of it from different people, and you're kind of a key character in it. So I, I want to talk to you more, and I'm going to do a book on this. So finally, I, re I relented, and I spent weeks with Blake and he spent weeks both in I spent time both in New York and then back here he came out and spent a lot of time here in California with me and uh, I was impressed by his diligence and the research he had done and he ended up going out and talking to over 200 people in uh, in getting this book written uh, both both Sega people Nintendo people retailers third-party publishers from every company imaginable, whether it's EA or Tengen or Ubisoft or Activision, retailers uh, and, and uh, Wall Street analysts. And so he ended up doing an extremely thorough job on this book. And so I've been very impressed by the research he did and the fact that it is a very complete history of a six-year period of time in the life of video games. And of course, there was a lot of things we did that changed the industry, and I was glad to see that written about. Yeah, so what what would you see when, when you look back on that type, time period, what changed the industry? What were some things that stick out in your mind? Oh, there were a bunch. I mean, the first thing, uh, obviously, all we did to be a competitor to Nintendo, but remember, part of our strategy was we were leaving Nintendo, uh, the children's market, basically. And we, Sega, were going to go after teenagers, college age, -ers, and older and so we were doing games that were designed really for an older audience most of the time. I mean, Sonic the Hedgehog is kind of an exception to that because it showed off the quality of the machine and the and the processor so so well. And it was for all ages, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but so we did, you know, we did more uh, strategic strategy games, role playing games. Everybody says, "Oh, you did a lot of violent game." That's true, but that's really a small part of the business. So anyway, going after the older audience was one thing. The formation of the E3 show was another. I mean, I was I the second year I was president and CEO of Sega of America were at the CES show in Las Vegas. And you know, CES show is consumer electronics show and you know, all the new computers, all the new TVs, all the new phones, all the new everything that's electronic are there. And way in the back of the convention center, they would put video games. Usually, you had to walk past the porn section to get to <laughs> us. Well, one year, they were so sold out, they had us not in the convention center, but in a tent that connected to the back of the convention center. So now, not only did you have to walk by everything else to find video games, you had to go into a tent. And there we were with Nintendo and EA and everybody else. And it was raining. And there was a leak in the tent right over my Sega Genesis displays. And I said, that's it. We're never coming back to CES again. We're going to do our own show. And I rallied uh, third-party publishers and got a lot of them to agree and got Sony to agree, who did not make hardware then. They only made software. And, of course, Nintendo wouldn't agree. But, anyway, we started the what became the E3 show. We, didn't, I, we called it something else the first couple of years, but eventually it became the E3 show. And so today when I, I just went to the E3 show a few weeks ago, and I see that it's got a hundred thousand people attending, wow, amazing. and it's taking up the entire Los Angeles Convention Center, uh, and they don't have enough space for everybody. That is quite an accomplishment. Yeah, that's huge. And then the and then the and then the other thing is, 
we we developed the uh, the rating system for video games uh, at Sega. Of course, nobody wanted to use the Sega system, so we had to change the name of it a little bit. The same guy ran it, by the way, Dr. Arthur Pogue, who ran the rating board, the ERE board for Sega. Then he ran it for the industry and had the same uh, educators, child psychologists, uh, sociologists doing the rating of the games, but we changed the nomenclature slightly. What was it called? So, then? Uh, it's what? called the ERB, the Entertainment oh. Rating. Oh, got it, got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and and that well, you know, initially, I mean, the changes are so minor. Initially, we did G for general audience. Today, they do G A for general all audiences. We did uh, uh, T for teens, and they they do T something for T twelve, T to twelve, T twelve or T to sixteen, depend, designating the age level. We did M for mature. They do M A for mature audience. So those kinds of changes were what exist today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it was all started by my little group at Sega and and Dr. Arthur Prober. Wow. Yeah. It's it's amazing to look back on and see that, you know, is just alive and well and kicking now. Tom, what's well, one today of your it's a sixty three billion yeah. dollar industry. It's amazing. I mean it's amazing yeah. what it is today. It's amazing. Um, Tom, what's one of your favorite stories from Console Wars? Well, I think I told my favorite one is the Walmart story. Oh, the Walmart, yes. But I I think one of the other tough ones, one of the hardest stories, was the formation of the Interactive Software Digital Association, the ISDA, which today is the ESA. They changed the name of that to the ESA. This is the association that every video game maker belongs to and now runs the E3 show. So the formation of that and the formation of the uh, rating system. Because, again, Nintendo said, hey, we don't need it. We don't, need, we don't do games that are, need to be rated because everything we do is for general audience. And we don't need to form a new association. And we don't need a rating board. And so it was a very violent behind-the-scenes argument between me and the, uh, the head of the, the CEO of Nintendo and the, the general counsel of Nintendo. And uh, eventually, they prevailed after the Senate subcommittee hearings on violence and video games started. The, the subcommittee hearings run by Senator Lee- Lieberman and Senator Cole. Then all of a sudden, Nintendo came around, even though they knew they didn't make or purported that they didn't make those kinds of games, because they saw that for the good of the industry, we needed an association. And certainly many of their third-party publishers needed an association to mm-hmm. to help uh, uh, with legislative matters in Washington, but also to rally the industry together and to, to manage this thing we call the E3 show and the, and the rating board. So eventually they came around, but it was quite a heated battle behind the scenes. So what was what was happening behind the scenes? When you say heated battle, like, well, they I'm just, trying to picture were, this because you seem like such a oh, nice well, man. I don't, I don't see any heat. Tell me about uh, some of the heat. Well, they were they were pretty upset with me. Needless to say, they basically hated me. Uh, first of all, I'd taken a lot of business away from them. Then I'm doing video games that have blood in them and are for mature audiences, which they deplored. And and then I I formed this E3 show. They didn't they wanted to just be able to have customers come out to Nintendo headquarters. What do they need to go to a show for? And then they're doing this rating thing. And I mean, they just basically hated me. And it was very personal. And uh, mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't get along well, uh, and we argued a lot. But uh, by the way, at the end of all of this, when I left Sega, and that's a whole other story, I got the nicest note in the world from Howard Lincoln, the president of Nintendo, who's, who basically, and I have the, and the notes in the book, and the, it's in the back of Console Wars, and it basically says to the effect that he now realizes how much I did for the industry and how much I would be missed and that he personally uh, was sorry that I was leaving the, uh, the industry. So I thought that was quite a, a statement for a guy who had fought me tooth and nail on every issue imaginable right. to at the end come around and say, hey, you know, you were right. You're not so <laughs> bad. <laughs> You're not so bad after all. Yeah. There was another meeting uh, or another story in the book about uh, a meeting with EA Sports that was kind of heated. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was a good one, too. Yes. So, so when I that was early in my career at Sega, I found out that Electronic Arts, 
Electronic Arts in those days wasn't anything like what it is today. Basically, Trip Hawkins had founded it with Larry Probst, uh, who's still chairman today, and a guy named Bing Gordon. And they, uh, they were primarily making games for Apple, for the Apple Macintosh. Well, the business wasn't going anywhere, and they were really in deep trouble. And they, they hated Nintendo because they didn't want to have to pay this huge fee that Nintendo extracted on each cartridge for their game. So they didn't want to do that, and they didn't get along with them. And then here we are coming along, entering the market. So they get this clever idea that if they reverse engineered a Genesis in a white room where there was no outside influence and it was just a select group of engineers that reverse engineered it completely, that they could figure out how to break the software code that was inside the Genesis and be able to manufacture cartridges on their own without paying us a royalty hmm. or a licensing fee uh, on those cartridges. And they were quite far along in that process. And so when I found out about this, I went over to EA to meet with them to discuss this. And the, Trip Hawkins is quite a character. He's very bright. And I walked into the room and he's telling me how great their company is. And meanwhile, I knew they were damn near near bankruptcy in those days and uh and how he's reverse engineering there wasn't anything we could do about it and he was going to make cartridges on the genesis and uh, that was it and i said trip didn't your mother ever teach you the difference between right and wrong and he got all upset and we started yelling at each other and uh i didn't think we were going to get anywhere uh but i i knew that if he did reverse engineer it successfully that he legally he would be able to do what he he wanted to really? do it oh, that wow. would yeah, and that that would be harmful because other uh, third-party licensees would then want to do the same thing. Right. So, and, you know, my point was, gee, you know, we spend all this money designing hardware and developing it, and we lose money on hardware. So the only way we as a company can make money is through the software that is played upon it. So we deserve a royalty because we're the ones getting this machine into the homes and taking the loss on, on right. it. Anyway, he disagreed with that, but we need, we had one other strong need during that was a, it's actually a, another day, maybe five days later, same, same set of characters. We were working on Joe Montana football, but the group we had working on it had failed to meet their deadlines and we desperately needed this game done for that Christmas season. And so I went back to EA and said, look, uh, rather than go to court, fight over this and spend each other's legal monies and run up the bills with lawyers, we'll give you a favored nation deal on, on the royalty licensing fee you pay us. It will be less than what others pay, but you have to give us the Madden game engine so that we can complete Joe Mon have Joe Montana football completed in time for the upcoming Christmas season. And initially they didn't agree to that, but later they did, and that's how uh, Joe Montana, the first game, got out in time for Christmas, and by the way, it outsold Madden. So that was quite interesting. Wow. Uh, that, that first two or three years, it actually outsold Madden. Not today. There is no Joe Montana football, and Madden's the, the only real successful football game. But but in those days, uh, Joe Montana football. But nobody knew it was the same engine. It was the same football engine. We just put Joe and the 49ers and other teams in there. Uh uh, but it was this almost the same game as Madden. Well, and you, it sounds like you're put in some pretty hostile situations. Yes, you could say that. <laughs> say that, and 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 you know. But normally, I came out of those pretty well. I mean, Trip and I speak today. I I think he's a fine fellow and doing some really good work today. So, you know, uh, it all works out in the end. Yeah. So, and then they're going to make Console Wars into a movie, from what I was That's reading. Yes, that's the plan. Well, first, it's going to be a documentary. The documentary has largely been shot, uh, and the documentary, of course, is a documentary. So it's it's me and on film. It's Al Nilsson on film. It's Howard Lincoln on film from Nintendo. It's the people who who were part of this battle in those days on film, and it's a very accurate story. Um, however, Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg have picked up the feature film rights. Sony has agreed to make the, the movie, and Scott Rudin, who produced uh, Moneyball and Social Network wow. and last year Captain Phillips and many, many other great films and TV shows, has agreed to produce the movie. 
So the feature film, uh, they're starting to write the script. But my understanding is uh, the end. they're starting it ba- basically next month. And uh, it'll take them quite a while to write that script. Yeah. And uh, then they'll get into casting and hopefully end up making a, a movie that I hope is successful. That's great. So the obvious question is, do you get any say in who plays you? I wish I did, but I don't. Uh, at least my understanding is I don't. I'm, I'm sure going to try to influence it. I mean, I'd like it to be somebody who kind of looked like I did 23 years ago. So who would that be? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Brad Pitt? <laughs> <laughs> Do they have someone, like, they'll have it 23 years ago and now, or just is it all going to be set at 23 years ago? I, I don't know. Oh, I guess. You, you've read the book, I assume, yeah. and, and I don't, you know, they're going to, Obviously, they have to shorten the, the, the script from the book. It can't be word for word from the book. So it's got to be a, a summary yeah. of it. And, uh, you know, I don't know how they're going to end it, if they'll do any, uh, here's what they're doing now or anything like that. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of my, Tom, one of my self-proclaimed special talents is spotting celebrity lookalikes. So I'll have to take a picture, look at a picture of you 23 years ago, and I'll be able to tell exactly who will, will play you. Oh, that's great. Please yeah. do. I'd love to know. <laughs> um, so then what happened? So after Sega, the next trans- transition was LeapFrog? Well, it was really Knowledge Universe and LeapFrog. Hmm. So I, so at the end of uh, my time at Sega, uh, Mike Milken, who I knew because he'd helped refinance Mattel back in the uh, subordinated adventure days, uh, and Larry Ellison, who lives up here in Atherton and whose offices in Redwood Shores was across the street almost from Sega. And there weren't many places to eat uh, in Redwood Shores in those days. And so we used to go over and use Larry's cafeteria. And it was really nice because it was basically really cheap food. I think some of it was even free because uh, he was you know, taking care of his employees. And we just partook of all that. And one day he came down and said, who the hell are you guys? I see you walking <laughs> across the street. And, uh, you know, he had kind of an affinity for, for Japanese people and Japanese art. And so he liked seeing some of the Japanese people that were part of our company. And uh, anyway, so I got to know Larry a little bit. Well, somehow he and Mike got together on this idea of using technology to improve education. And their idea was quite broad. It was literally cradle-to-grave education. So they each committed $250 million to wow. a fund. And they said, well, who are we going to have run this thing now? And it turned out I was the only guy they knew in common. I think that's how that decision was made. I'm not sure. No, actually, they knew. They both knew I had a, a real interest in, in technology and education. Yeah. And I, your background. In, yeah, you know, I, I had, and there's a lot of things I had done that we haven't talked about. I mean, I'd been involved with the RAND think tank on education policy. I'd been on school boards. I'd used, uh, actually, at Sega, I did the Pico, the child's first computer, which was an education device. And sold $100 million worth of that, and a lot of other stuff. And so I was really interested in using this power of technology, like video game technology, for improving education. So this was a wonderful job for me. I mean, a wonderful position. I couldn't have been more pleased. And out of that, we our first or second investment, actually, was LeapFrog. And I, while I still retained the uh, title of president of Knowledge Universe, I also became CEO of LeapFrog. We built it from a $9 million business to a $700 million business, the wow. largest educational toy company in the world today. And everything we do is really effective. I mean, we work with Stanford professors and Berkeley professors and Wisconsin professors and, and make sure that everything we do actually helps a child learn that particular subject. A lot of it's reading-oriented or math-oriented. And, and then we did other companies. We started Knowledge Beginnings, which is the largest chain of preschools across the United States. We started something called K-12, which trades under the symbol LRN, Learn, on the NASDAQ. And it's a, a very large curriculum company for charter schools and virtual schools and homeschoolers. It's got about a billion-dollar market cap today. We, we bought uh, 
something called Tech, which was the executive committee. We changed the name to Vistage, and it really was education for presidents of small companies, helping them be better presidents. Hmm. So we really were literally from young kids all the way up to businessmen. Oh, we did a lot in IT training. We owned the largest IT training company in Europe and probably the third largest here in the United States. So w- overall, we did 36 different companies, and it was a really wonderful experience, a great ride. I learned a lot of, a lot more about education, and I liked the part that was dealing with young kids the most, so I tended to spend more time on that than I did with things the leapfrog. like that. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, uh, so that was just a, a great experience for me. So, I mean, you're obviously a seasoned CEO at that point when, you, when they brought you on. Do you feel any pressure? Oh, always, always lots of pressure. I mean, you got, I mean, first of all, Mr. Mr. Milken and Ellison are pretty tough guys. You know, there's a lot of pressure from them to to make these companies perform well. And then some of the companies we took public. So then you're back to having shareholder pressure. I mean, I was CEO of LeapFrog for for, uh, 10 years, basically. I'm still vice chairman of the company. And while I was CEO, you have that constant shareholder pressure quarterly earnings pressure you've got to meet the expectations yeah. of wall street and its analysts and that's very difficult very difficult yeah. what do you do to manage stress and pressure um well i i do exercise and i also uh, uh play golf uh i used to play a lot of tennis as well i i just slowed down in that area um and then i i have a way of just kind of putting it all i compartmentalize well and so I can just leave the business stuff yeah. and pretty much go home and do family stuff. And, uh, you know, every now and then that gets interrupted with phone calls. That makes me uncompartmentalize the business and think about it. But most of the time, not. I'm, I'm yeah. very good at just leaving the business pressures at the office. Yeah. And then, you know, what you mentioned with LeapFrog, it went from $9 million to $700 million. Yes. What were some of the key things? I mean, that's huge growth. What were some of some of the key things that allowed it to grow so much? It's well, uh, number one, we had a, a really great. The founder of the company is a great guy named Mike Wood, and he was a lawyer whose son had some issues in learning to read, hmm. and so Mike was, it turned from being a lawyer to inventing technologies that helped young children learn to read, in particular to understand phonic uh, phonemes and phonics sounds and. Uh, and sight words and that sort of thing. He was very good at that. And so he was he was great. He became, uh, a, well, when we went public, he asked if he could be CEO. So we made him CEO in 2002. And after we went public, he said, this is the worst job in the world. I don't want to deal with bankers and Wall Street and analysts and shareholders. Let, let me You're like, that's the life I've been being, living. No, <laughs> Let me go back to being president and chief creative officer. So we did. But, yeah. And I ret- returned to being CEO at that point. But anyway, uh, he's a great guy. Great starting point. The other thing was the team again. We brought in, and by the way, I brought in a couple of my ex-Sega people to help. Uh, Paul Rio, Joe Miller. Um, Leila Tassi and operations, a bunch of ex-Sega people to, to help and then hired great people again, hired very, very strong individuals. Yeah. And, uh, and then, as I mentioned, we made sure through research that every product we did actually was efficacious. It worked. You know, if we said this product was going to help your child learn to read, it did. And it was fun for the ki- kids to use. Right. So we, and to answer your question more specifically, aside from the team and 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 doing uh, great creative and inter- educational and entertaining uh, content, we also used uh, technology and we bought a company called Explore that had this unique uh, technology where an ink carried a light conductive charge, and you could put a book on top of a platform and have the book uh, either touch a, touch a uh, picture and it would read to the child hmm. or decode a word and phonetically decode words and then touch it a second time and give the child a definition of the word. So it really helped kids learn to read. They, if, they got a, if they were reading and they got to a word they didn't understand, they could phonetically decode it and then touch it and hear it said and hear a, 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 an explanation of what that word meant. So that was a great technology. and. and propelled the company upward. Um, and then later, we 
we got into doing uh, basically a, a, a handheld device like Game Gear. We called it Leapster. If you look at it, it looks an awful lot like Game Gear, uh, and and but it's all the content on it is educational, and that helped us be greatly successful. And then today we're doing tablets, which are are unbreakable tablets with great content and curriculum on them for young kids. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about global education learning. That's where you do you spend yeah. most of your time there now, or I do. I, I still I still am involved with Leapfrog as vice chairman. I'm also on the board of Cambium Learning Group, which is a group of uh, education companies that sell their curriculum to schools. They don't sell to consumers, just to schools. So they're made up of Voyager, Sopris, Learning A to Z, Explore Learning, a, a few other companies. And uh, so I spent some time on that. But then my main passion today is global education learning. Mm-hmm. And this goes back to I, when I was at Mattel, we were the first company to open manufacturing in China after the curtain was opened. And I spent a lot of time in China. I love the country. I like seeing these little kids and, and wanted to do something about helping them get educated as well. And so we're focused on the China market right now. And we studied the market and we're looking for ways of, uh, of entering by buying a company that reached the mothers in different ways. And so we bought one, we bought one company so far, it's called Yaolan, which means cradle in Mandarin. So cradle the child, cradle of the earth. And uh, it reaches moms because it provides them with information on how to educate their kids. They go to the site, it's the most trusted parenting site in China right now. They go to the site looking for information on different subjects. How do I teach my child English? How do I teach him math? How do I, where should I go to teach piano, get him to learn piano? All kinds of questions like that we answer for parents across China. Mm -hmm. We also have an assessment tool called the growth ladder that the moms use for, they they fill it out themselves online and it assesses their, where their child is at compared to all the other children of the same age. Mm And we give them a report back and some suggested things they might want to do. So we have that one product. And it's a small company right now. We'll do maybe uh, $12 to $14 million in revenue this year. But we're growing 40 to 50% a year. And we're looking for other companies to buy over there that reach moms in another way. We'd like Mm -hmm. to buy a company that reached moms through retail and had an educational product, probably an ESL product. We'd like to reach moms through... Uh, learning centers. We'd like to do more curriculum for learning centers in China. So we're trying to trying to put this together, much like we put Knowledge Universe together. Put this together only focus on young children yeah. and focused on China. What's your process for? Obviously, you probably go through a lot of companies research oh, yeah. before you purchase one. What's the process? What are you looking for when you purchase a company? Well, you know, it's funny you say that because we first put together a list with a description of 500 different companies in China. We then whittled it down by resetting the criteria to 200. My partner and CEO, Anthony Chang, who is Chinese, has visited all 200 of those companies personally. I visited 100. And you can tell a lot by visiting the company and visiting the headquarters yeah. and talking to the employees yeah. about do they are they really serious about education for young kids? Do they have a passion for it? Do they care about it? Yeah. And then what's the quality of their particular product? And that's where we would kind of get interested. If we found high quality company, very interested in education, we would pursue them until we got down to a point of of are they interested in selling or not a lot of times they're not in this case of Yalan they were interested in selling and uh, they were interested because they didn't see a way of really growing without outside help and outside capital and so um, and there's a we have three or four other companies that we'd like to purchase as well because of the same thing they 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 need help in in growing and they think we with our particular background and skills can can help them so, but it's all, it always comes down to, is it a good product or service? Mm-hmm. Uh, would we want it for our own children if we lived there? Right. And then uh, does the, does the, do the numbers work out? Right. You know, does the math work out? Do you look for certain numbers, like you want certain growth or you want certain users or does that not play? Yeah. Oh, yeah, hugely. I mean, you know, when we bought y'all on, I think it had maybe 4 million moms using it each month. Yeah, Today we've got 
13 million wow. moms using it each month. So we obviously were able to increase the usage dramatically. Um, and a lot of that was just redoing the website, making it more friendly. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, read Chinese and I don't dare speak Chinese. I understand a little, but I don't uh, purport to. So that part was hard for me. I had to really rely on my partners. But, you know, even me and as an American looking at a site, I can tell when it's too busy or too crowded. Or right. Vision. It's probably so, better you know, for you to not understand that you can look and be. see. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Tom, I wanted to hear two things. One, yeah, obviously you've had tons of success. What's been a painful moment or a low point? Well, I've had a couple, I would say. Uh, I, je- I have this tendency to put low points and bad things and negatives out of my mind. Right. But uh, one of the things I, I think if I think back on with a great deal of regret, and I wonder what I could have done to made the outcome better, was in the book it describes where I was working with Sony with a guy named Olaf Olafsson, who I became very close to, and Mickey Shuloff, who was president of Sony at the time. And Sony, in those days, was just learning how to do software. And basically, they came to me and said, can you help us do great software and we'll be a a third-party publisher on your platforms? And we said, sure. And so we really spent a lot of time helping them and their company uh, become good at making software. And this was on the Genesis and then on the on the CD uh, drive for it. And then then later we said, you know, we know it all platforms have an end to their life. Olaf and I said, well, let's let's come up with the specs for a new platform that we'll do together. We Sony, we certainly understand that you guys at Sega if, at best break even on hardware and you have to make all your money for from software. So why don't we do a platform together? Let's get our engineers together and have them come up with the specs for the next platform. And uh, we'll call it whatever. We'll call it the Sony Sega or the Sega Sony platform. And uh, anyway, this progressed. And we went to Sony headquarters in Japan. And they said, that's a great idea. We want to do that with you. We went to my company headquarters in Japan, Sega, and the board and Nakayama-san said, what are you, crazy? Why do we want to work with Sony? They don't know how to do a video game platform. Well, let's just uh, forget it. We'll keep going on our own. And this was a horrible mistake in my mind. And, and, and about that point, I knew this was it. I had, to, I had to leave Sega. But what could I have done that would have made that outcome mm. different? If you I had convinced them. Yeah. If I had... Think about what the world would have been today. It would have been this giant Sega Sony corporation in the video game world. Instead, Sega is a minor software player today, and Sony is a very important, uh, successful player. So that was a you know a, a low point for yeah. me, and I felt like yeah. I did not do my job. I should have been able to convince these guys to to do this. I would say the other low point for me was when I left Mattel. I loved Mattel. Uh, I really loved the company. I couldn't imagine life not being at Mattel. But I had I had been CEO, and then I was co-CEO, and I really probably had no business being CEO because I didn't know how to deal with Wall Street. I was you know young. I was forty years old. I didn't I, I didn't know uh, uh, you know the analysts that well. I had I had been insulated a bit from the financial Wall Street side of the company, and so my co-CEO clearly deserved to be CEO. And at some point, I had to say, you know, John, you do need to be CEO, and, and I shouldn't be. And he said, that's great. You can still stay on as president of Mattel. But I didn't think that was right because I felt there were factions growing inside the company, and I didn't want to be part of this a battle in a company that I loved. And so I basically uh, said, no, I'm going to leave. But it was helpful for me to leave because I had so many good friends at Mattel and I still do today. I, I still uh, communicate and see many old Mattel friends today. So that was a very painful yeah. thing for me. As it turned out, it worked out pretty well. You know, I mean, leaving Mattel was not the worst thing in the world for me. I had a lot of success after it. But at the moment, it was very hard to imagine leaving. Yeah. What, what advice would you give your younger self um, with the board, with the Sony Sega um, situation? What would you I tell your, I, your younger self now? 
Well, I think I would have said, I think I should have done a description of what the video game industry would have looked like five years in the future yeah. with a Sega Sony combination or without a Sega Sony combination. And I didn't do that. Uh, I might have said it, but I didn't pre present it in mm. numbers, which I think yeah. would have changed their minds had I, had I done that better. Because the power of Sony was greater than Sega ever imagined. And together, it could have been a really formidable, wonderful partnership. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like you reading the letters for the Flintstone vitamins, that, that type of moment. Yes, yes. yes. So, yes. Tom, what, um, what's been one of the proudest accomplishments? Obviously, you have a long, successful career. What sticks out to you in that front? Well, I, I, I really think the, 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 the speed with which we were able to pass Nintendo in share market and build a billion and a half dollar business in the United States and a billion dollar business in Europe uh, was really unbelievable. I mean, it's amazing to have done that in three years. So I'm very proud of that and very proud of that team. Yeah. At the same time, I will tell you, turning Barbie around after it was suffered its first decline and fallen from hundreds of millions to 42 million and rebuilding it to 500 some plus million was also a major, major feat, I think. So I think those two things are really what I'm, I'm proudest of. And, and by the way, though, I mean, it really wasn't me. It was, I was able to get these great, bright people uh, to do this yeah. and to come up with the ideas for it and to, to manage it down to uh, uh, great, great amounts of detail that are, that are you know, very important to manage all the details well. Yeah. Um, just, uh, I have one last question. Um, I appreciate your time. Before I ask it, just tell people what's exciting now. Where should people check out maybe the Console Wars book or the, you know, the global learning platform? Where should people go and check out? Well, I would say uh, read Console Wars. Uh, Con Console Wars, I think, I mean, other people have told me they really enjoyed the story. And people who had nothing to do with the video game business or, or didn't care about the video game business find it an interesting story because it was what a team can do against almost a monopolist. And uh, uh, so I think that's the, the, the first thing I would say. And then the other thing I, I would say, and the one piece, I don't like to give advice, but the one advice yeah. I have is don't ever believe the experts. The experts are always wrong. If I had believed the experts, I never would have thought it possible to turn Barbie around. If I had believed the experts, frankly, I never would have been involved in doing Flintstones because everybody said that wasn't going to succeed. I never would have uh, done Masters of the Universe. Never would have, uh, never would have joined Sega. I mean, a company with two percent market share. Were you crazy to think you could take on somebody with ninety-eight percent share of market? And by the way, when we did Leapfrog, I know this sounds crazy, but when we did Leapfrog. Most of the Wall Street analysts and the experts in the toy business said, what are you, nuts? Moms say they want education, but they won't pay for it. Right. And so you won't be successful. And so my, the one thing I've learned in my life is don't believe the experts. They're almost always wrong. And since I'm now considered an expert, you can figure it out. I must be wrong. Too. <laughs> and, then so, and then is there a site for the uh, leapfrog that people can check out? Or sure. Go to leapfrog. Go to leapfrog.com. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if they have a child, they can start that child on a learning path where the site will uh, uh, know what the child's skills and abilities are as they participate with different leapfrog products and will give reports back to mom, whether they want them weekly or monthly, whatever they want, telling their, the mom about their progress their child is making, particularly in reading and math subjects. Yeah. So, Tom, my last question is the obvious, I guess. What drives you? I mean, it doesn't look like you have any – you're not slowing down anytime soon. And you're just keep forging ahead. What drives you, know, you to, to keep going? That's a great question. You, I tried retiring. I didn't like it. Uh, you know, I tried playing golf three times a week and talking to guys who only wanted to talk about their investment portfolio and their grandkids. And I didn't like it. Uh, so that kind of, I, I did that f for a brief period of time, a year or so, and I really did not like it. So I got back into the, 
uh, the world here, the business world. I, I love uh, the business world. I love the action. And I feel like I've got a lot to give still. I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm still learning all the time. And uh, I, here I am, I'm going to be 70 next month. And, uh, you know, I don't want to stop. My wife says, when are you going to slow down? I said, I don't want to slow down. I don't want to stop. I want to keep doing good things that I'm proud of. And now, in particular, all the work for the last, since 1995, I've been, 96, I've been doing is, I think, helping, helping educate children and, and, and older uh, teens and adults. And I want to keep doing that. I want to help keep working on those issues and problems. Yeah. Tom, I want to be the first one to thank you so much for your time. This has been very valuable. Everyone, check out LeapFrog. Check out Console Wars. And uh, Tom, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye.